Good afternoon, everyone. I am Hannah Myers, Director of Manhattan Institute's Initiative on Policing and Public Safety. A lead aim of this new effort is to produce innovative thinking on policing, on policing based on empirical research and creative ideas. This requires not only rigorous scholarship, but brave and genuine voices. Because without the commitment to truthfully articulate what we see, how can we reject what is wrong and move toward what is right? Our two guests today have earned loyal followings for their depth of knowledge, for their gusto in approaching difficult topics, and for their honesty, even when it flies in the face of popular narratives or even niceties. I am sure you will share my delicious anticipation of their back and forth today on policing, race, and ideological conformity as they challenge each other on these issues. So I eagerly hand the proceedings over to Glenn Lowry to introduce Heather McDonald and himself and start off their conversation. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Hannah. Hi, I am indeed Glenn Lowry, Professor of Economics and of International and Public Affairs at Brown University. And um, I'm delighted to be in conversation with Heather McDonald, uh, who is the Thomas W. Smith Fellow at the Manhattan Institute and also a contributing editor uh, to the Institute's magazine, City Journal, and a prolific writer and a friend. Can I call you a friend, Heather? I would be honored. Uh, that's a, that's the first time. And can I call you a friend then? Is it? Yeah. I think, okay, good. Excellent. Let's be friends because I okay. really do uh, get a lot out of uh, your contributions to public debate and so on. So here we are talking. I could say a lot about you. I'm supposed to introduce you. BA in English from Yale, oh, please, MA please. in English from Clare College, uh, Cambridge University, JD at Stanford Law, clerking for a federal judge and whatnot, best-selling books, The War on Cops. That was a monster of an intervention in public discussion about one of the most important issues I can think of, the diversity delusion. Uh, I know what you're talking about because I live in academia and uh, the gender and race obsession of uh, my colleagues and our institutions uh, uh, is, is, is a fit for criticism, if not outright ridicule, in my humble opinion. But in any case, enough. How you doing? Well, yeah, oh, yeah. I, I, I'm getting feedback. Uh, you don't have to live in academia any longer to know that the diversity delusion is way out of control. Arguably, that is uh, one of the defining features of our world today, as Andrew Sullivan says, we're, we all are on campus now. You know, we're all in gender studies. So uh, thanks a lot, Glenn, for for being part of an institution that is that is in the process of uh, tearing down Western civilization. I would argue. Uh, Strong statement, Heather. Well, the gatekeepers are are absent. The you know what I'm seeing is the betrayal of the gatekeepers. Uh, there's not a single art professor, literature professor, head of a classical music organization that is not that is standing up to the legacy that it is his obligation to defend in the face of these phony charges of racism and sexism. Uh, it's it's terrifying. Uh, in if this doesn't get stopped, there's going to be very little left that we can love and honor in our in our civilization uh, within a year or so. But I know that uh, the Manhattan Institute wants us to talk about policing, so I'm, I'm afraid I got us on a, on a different track. No, there. that's okay. I was going to go further down the road, but maybe you're right. I mean, I was going to uh, qualify a little bit by saying there are pockets of sanity that uh, struggle on by, by saying that, you know, if you work really hard at it, you can get an education. Uh, you can find students who are interested in, you know, the great books and the great ideas and so on. Uh, and there's a lot of cowardice and cowering, you know, of people who agree with you and me about this, basically, but who just are afraid. My inbox is full of letters from people all over this country. I mean, dozens and dozens of them saying, thank God that you're out there doing what you're doing. But and here they tell me a story, but I can't say anything, you know, because because my career would be affected, because friendships would be ruined, my life would be miserable, and so on and so forth. So it is a problem. But yeah, we're supposed to, we're supposed to be talking about policing. Heather, um, we're at a moment of racial reckoning. Um, whenever a cop, God help us if he's white, shoots a citizen who is black in the process of carrying out their duties, it becomes a federal case. Mobs gather in streets. Uh, literally, mobs gather, in effect, around courthouses demanding particular outcomes of judicial process. 
uh, politicians bring charges against people on no merit whatsoever in order to placate these mobs. Um, I, I just wonder what the heck is going on. I mean, you've been writing about this kind of thing for a long time, and it, it feels like we've reached a, a critical, a critical moment with the Breonna Taylors and the George Floyds and the Ahmed Arbery's and and the so forth uh, of the of this world and these incidents. And I should say they're regrettable because I believe they are regrettable. I think the loss of life is regrettable because I believe it is regrettable. But I do wonder whether or not um, the the uh, reactions are are um, doing more damage than they are good. It's even to the well-being of Black lives on behalf of which these reactions are are offered. And I, I just want to give you an opportunity to you know talk about that a little bit. Well, I agree. Uh, this is an amazing moment where there's not a single aspect of the criminal justice system that is not under attack and possibly in the process of being unwound because of disparate impact. Uh, any Anything that a criminal justice system does, whether it's arresting criminals or sentencing them, uh, if that falls upon a, a black criminal, notwithstanding that that black criminal has been preying on the millions, thousands of law-abiding, hardworking black citizens in his community, that criminal justice system is suspect. Uh, California is passing a law that would allow any criminal defendant to basically stop the proceedings against him by challenging his, his uh, sentencing, by challenging the way he was charged, based not on actual evidence of discrimination in his trial, but on statistical evidence that allegedly similarly situated uh, defendants in his position of a different race, i.e. whites, or maybe Asians or Hispanics, uh, were not as severely charged or not as severely sentenced. Uh, this is ridiculous. Uh, the statistical evidence rarely takes into account adequately criminal history, uh, the actual severity of, of an offense, but this is going to stop, in California at least, it is going to stop the possibility of prosecuting gangbangers. And I find it astounding, Glenn, that over the last several months, as shootings are going up exponentially in inner city areas, the only conversation we've been having on a national basis is about white supremacy. I've I've collected just a few of the shootings that have gotten no press response over the last couple months. And I'm only going to read a few of them from a, a last couple weeks. But this is what's happening that n people are turning their eyes away from. October 2nd, 14-year-old girl shot in the West Englewood section of Chicago while standing on a sidewalk. September 26th, 15-year-old boy fatally shot in the head on the far west side of Chicago, September 1. One-year-old boy in Kansas City, Missouri, killed when someone walked up to the car in which she was riding and riddled it with bullets. September 15th, 15-year-old girl shot to death in St. Louis. September 11th, 14-year-old boy killed in drive-by shooting in Northeast Baltimore. September 10th, female mail carrier on the far side of Chicago, fatally shot in head, abdomen, legs, and buttocks. September 7th, 60-year-old boy shot at the annual Jouvert party that opens the West Indian Day Parade. August 29th, seven-year-old seven girl killed at a family birthday party in South Bend, Indiana. Needless to say, uh, those victims are all black children. They compromise just one part of the 40 black children who have been killed in drive-by shootings since the George Floyd uh, tragic death. And we turn our eyes away from them because they don't fit the narrative. Instead, we're talking about phantom white supremacy. It is, it is a remarkable uh, failure, I would say, in our public discourse. The press are playing a fundamental role in this. People are deciding what stories to write about, which broadcast to make, yeah. uh, and so what commentaries to offer. Uh, what do you think accounts for the... Um, the coloration of the uh, uh, press's reaction to these problems. I mean, 
what's going on? I, I, I really am asking a question because I don't know the answer to this. I can't, I mean, I understand blatant partisanship. Trump said it, I hate Trump, therefore I have to be against it. This, this I get, but the pathos, the loss, the tragedy, the pain, the humanity of these situations. Imagine a parent who loses a child at gunshot at five years old or something like that. This is a story. I mean, I don't care what color these people are. This is certainly a part of our contemporary uh, uh, lives that warrants to be uh, given voice to, to. I want somebody at the funeral. I, I want them to cover, I want them to interview the parents and the little kids who were the friends. I want them to go to the school where these youngsters may have been uh, uh, going to uh, class every day and talk to the teachers and the parents. Where are these stories? I, you know, so so this is something I really, I, I you know, I, I don't understand uh, quite apart from partisan politics, why the curiosity about the human dimension of this aspect of our contemporary lives uh, doesn't drive uh, the reporters and maybe not the New York Times, but the Dayton, whatever, or, you know, to to cover these things in, in a greater depth. What do you think about that? Well, not to answer directly, I would point out, I, and I'm, I'm appalled by the rapidity with which the left plays the racism card these days. And I think it's just, again, that is destroying our civilization as well. But in this case, I, I'm very tempted to say that it is objectively racist because if we change the race on those children who've been killed to white, I have not a moment's doubt that there would be a national revolution, that this would be a huge story, uh, that politicians would be called to account. Uh, and the media would be there. If if I were a black activist, I'd be furious. If I were a Black Lives Matter activist, I would be furious. We saw what happened with Newton, Connecticut. You know, two dozen white children killed. Uh, that became the source of public discourse for months on end. Now, they were all at one time, uh, but the cumulative toll in black communities of gang drive-by shootings uh, reaches Newton, Connecticut's level, uh, you know, within within months. And the remarkable thing, and that is another proof that the Black Lives Matter activists, that it's all just a fraud and a sham and a a a a play for political power, is that they don't bring up these black lives. They're never, there's not, I have never, ever, ever seen a Black Lives Matter activist at, at some of the local, very local vigils and protests against this violence that the good people in inner city communities uh, do assemble uh, without attention from the national media, but the Black Lives Matter activists don't give a damn because it does not fit what turns out to be an enormously powerful narrative uh, about white supremacy. The, the pitulation of elite whites to that narrative is so automatic and the bounty that flows from their capitulation at this point so magnificent in its princely largesse uh, that there's simply no reason to, to uh, change one's tune. And I would just add quickly, I think you know what's driving this is that Americans with well intentions are with good intentions are despairing at changing that inner city culture and would rather turn their eyes away from it because perhaps they fear it is not changeable which I would disagree with but that's that's my explanation for the root cause I don't know what what your explanation is Glenn yeah, I don't know that I have one actually. I think there's something to what you say, I, but the racism point is a deep point. If you really cared about black people, uh, you would uh, stick your neck out of the foxhole of uh, you know the Overton window kind of foxhole of what's permissible to be said, and you'd take a chance and uh, you'd decry, you'd call thuggery, thuggery. You'd call vicious, uh, you know, kind of lack of, uh, 
contempt for the value of human life, you call it what it is, you, you would um, uh, be willing to confront, you know, Joe Biden goes to the bedside of um, Jacob Blake, and then he issues a statement about uh, Jacob Blake. And this, I mean, no disrespect to Jacob Blake, no, uh, you know, gratuitous disrespect to Jacob Blake, but is he an honorable man? I, I would have questions about whether or not he's an honorable man. Whatever may have happened to him, I would have questions about whether or not a presidential candidate should be speaking to the country from his bedside and telling us about his hopes and dreams for recovery. I would just, but who's going to write that piece and is going to say, uh, no, no to uh, that kind of uh, that that kind of behavior. So, so, you well, know. Candace Owens. I mean, she basically showed herself to be probably the most courageous person in history uh, by recording a video uh, several months ago about George Floyd and lamenting the fact that the the majority of martyrs that are being celebrated now to police violence have very, very uh, questionable backgrounds. They're, they're criminals. And that points out a reality of police violence that it is overwhelmingly occasioned by criminal behavior or resisting behavior on the part of, of uh, individuals. That this is something that criminology has known for decades that the biggest predictor of officer behavior is civilian behavior. You know, if a civilian resists yeah. uh, lawful effort to gain compliance, uh, the officer is going to escalate his own force to gain compliance. And, and it, it can ratchet up to tragic levels, obviously. But, but uh, that's what's going all of practically all of these shootings could have been avoided if, if somebody had resisted arrest. Um, George Floyd, I want to talk about it. And the, the, this thing that we're talking about now, the kind of self-censorship and the, the uh, you know, constrained ability to have an open discourse about what's actually going on for fear of giving offense or for fear of violating some stricture and coming off looking like you're a racist or like you're indifferent, it, it affects everybody. And it certainly affects even me. So a friend sends me an email. He says, a gold casket? Really? This is George Floyd's funeral, okay? Kason, you know, you would have thought it was JFK. You would have thought, right. you know, really? Okay, and um, I'm thinking, I'm an African-American. I'm saying, oh my God, look at my people, my black people, look at how we, you know, I see Al Sharpton up there doing his shtick. I, you know, I hear all the mournful uh, recitations of the platitudes and whatnot. Now, did not speak ill of the dead, certainly not speak ill of the black dead brought to, uh, you know, death by the hands of a police officer. But come on, really? Th yeah. This is, and what are we saying to our children? I mean, here's what I want to argue with people. I say, when Obama was elected, you told me role models, he's going to change everything. Young black men will have another, you know, whatever. Well, there's a flip side to that. If you make miscreants, uh, you know, not even near do wells. Bums into your heroes. What are you saying to your children? What are you offering up as a vision about how we, that is now African Americans, should be living? So, I mean, we, I guess we can go on like this, Heather. I'm not sure. I, I should probably try to. Uh, well, I, yeah, I have something to ask. What, you. A, what a counter argument would be here, but I mean, you know. <laughs> it, it is heart wrenching to see the nobility, the honor, the courage of blacks in the first part of the 20th century who made the best of themselves, who contributed so much to American culture, the musicians, Ella Fitzgerald, Duke Ellington, with dress to the nines, giving us beauty, sublimity in their music, in their dignity, at a time when they were subject to such heart-wrenching hatred and and contempt and yet they had the the broadness and greatness of spirit to keep moving forward in a belief that integration was possible 
and that they could strive and meet high standards and that ultimately we would be one culture and now we have an oppositional culture you know the identity uh of a, a large portion not i would say the entirety but at least of many black leaders and some uh just black american citizens is oppositional you know the whole anti-white ethic in schools which defines academic effort as a sellout to black identity uh and and this is part of a broader movement that just came out of the 60s where you had protest uh being celebrated as as necessarily right because the civil rights protests were necessarily right but from then on uh the idea that america was ineradicably evil you know took hold and and now you have people celebrating as you say uh actual some of them thugs simply because uh they stand as an as an opposite pole to authority uh but what i would like to ask you i've been tracing this summer a piece that i have never been able to finish yet but the whole law and order meme which is used the new york times and the washington post endlessly say that every time trump invokes law and order uh that's a dog whistle and that that's a racist phrase yeah. well i i I'd, i'd be interested in your opinion on that is that correct because what's weird about that claim is that it implicitly seems to acknowledge what is for boten to be said explicitly which is that there is an extraordinarily disproportionate level of black criminal offending so if you're talking about law and order uh you're going to be talking about trying to uh protect oneself from criminals who are disproportionately black now they one wouldn't be allowed to say that in the new york times but what is your view is it is is references to law and order now fatally poisoned by 1950s and 1960s rhetoric or is that a legitimate uh campaign platform i'll i'll you know show my cards i think it is i think we are yeah. you know the breakdown of law and order these last couple months is terrifying we're on the we're on the edge of civil anarchy but what is how do you respond to that phrase uh I think it's perfectly legitimate. I think indeed it's necessary. I think it's imperative. Frankly, I think Obama ought to have used it. I said it. <laughs> Obama, when Baltimore was up in flames after Freddie Gray, when Ferguson, uh, Missouri was up in flames uh, after uh, Michael Brown, the president of the United States, a black man, could have done something that might have spared us this, Heather. Had he stood up in front of the microphone instead of saying stuff like if i had a son he'd look like trayvon and stuff like uh you know i can't quote him we could do the research but basically let's not overreact to this thing give people a chance to blow off steam after all they've got a beef instead of saying that if he had said as a black man the first priority the first imperative of the government is to secure individuals in their person and their property no political objection justifies setting fire to anybody's anything no political objection does it right. we are a country of laws and i am the chief law enforcement officer of the country and notwithstanding my commitment to civil rights and my love of african american culture and my appreciation of the frustrations of people i in the office of president must insist he could have said it he didn't yeah. say it I can't tell you why he didn't say it, but I can say had he said it, it could have completely changed, in my opinion, it could have changed the uh, political possibility set for anybody who occupies that office because then the race card uh, argument, he's trying to uh, dog whistle to the white racists out there by using law and order, would have no credibility whatsoever, Trump or anybody would be able to say, well, wait, wait, here was Barack Obama, your first black president. I'm the president of the United States. I'm simply doing my job. He could have said, had Obama, et cetera. So um, who is going to suffer 
if civil society collapses in these cities? Who are going to be the people, not only from the criminal violence, but also from the collapse of the economic activity, as you have, as you have pointed out in some of your writing? I know I'm not going to invest my life savings in opening up a small business on an avenue when I look and see a housing project two miles down the road and I have to contemplate the probability is you know, 0.15 that they're going to burn me down if a police officer has to use this, uh, et cetera. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't make that investment. Um, so of course it's legitimate. Now, uh, I can see what a counter argument here might be. They would say, uh, look at, this is a, this is something that the Republicans have used going back a long way, uh, Richard Nixon, et cetera. Uh, there are after all people out there who are, uh, going to be responsive to if, if you know, they're going to, if I say suburbs, are endangered by civil disorder, they're gonna think suburbs white, inner city black, whatever, whatever. So uh, they'll say that there's some kind of historical precedent for uh, for using the law and order trope as a, as a way to activate the, the racist, uh, subconscious racism of American uh, politics. Um, but if you're asking me, and I, I, you know, I've, I've told you what I think, uh, I, I believe that President Obama actually ought to have responded quite differently to the civil disorder that uh, took place during his administration. If he had done so, I, I think we would have had a very different uh, situation going forward. Well, those, that was just an absolutely inspiring uh, uh, speech. And I wish you'd been a speechwriter. And I think you've got a career ahead of you. You've got you to get out there more. Uh, and that raises an issue when you say it's the, his, you know, the argument is, well, there's a historical precedent for that trope. And therefore, when we use it today, it must mean the same thing. That's one of the questions that we're facing today with the uh, alleged reckoning with white supremacy and, and white privilege. How much can a culture change? You know, is it possible to do an about face or is that unrealistic? And I would say, contrary to all expectations, you know, if you had looked at the at the fervor with which segregation was defended as long as possible in the 50s and 60s and and the seeming blindness of the majority of America to its founding violations of, of principle and their, their endurance, you know, from, if you, if you didn't know today, you could say, yeah, the 1619 project, that's plausible. You know, Ta-Nehisi Coates, that it's the very, it's the very essence of America to destroy the black body. That's possible. But I would say that the country has changed fantastically. We all talk about white privilege. Let's be honest. You know, you don't have to look at these, uh, these, these professors who were trying to pass as black uh, to, <laughs> to realize that if yeah. you have a child applying to college today, uh, he's got a lot better chance if he's black than if he's white. And let's be honest, that applies as well to getting a faculty job getting a promotion, getting a job at Google, getting a job at Paul Weiss Law Firm, uh, getting a job at, at yeah. Bank of America, uh, that it would seem when it comes to the overwhelming experience. Now, again, one has to throw in the mandatory uh, disclaimer. Well, of course, there's racists out there. I'm going to do that only to recognize that that's mandatory, but I actually don't believe it's very useful because those people do not have any effect really on the life course of most blacks today. And if we're gonna say that, I insist that we also say, let's acknowledge black anti-white racism, which is very real. Sure. Uh, if you know, you don't have to spend much time outside of, of Sharpton's National Action Network, which I have done uh, to hear some real anti-white racism for understandable reasons, but that is pretty ingrained, I would say. So I would argue that his, we have changed our history and we have to be able to say that uh, as, as, as unrealistic as it is, but often conservatives point out the fact that when it comes to gay rights, 
that too was just an extraordinary about face in a, a period of time that nobody would have expected. So I, I think that we shouldn't be held hostage to what was a very blind and very callous history. Actually, if people go back and open up Gunnar Myrdal's uh, two-volume treatise, An American Dilemma, written in the 1930s and 40s, and take a look at what he describes as the social situation of the Negro uh, at that time. I think the modal occupation of a Black man was farm laborer and of a Black woman was domestic servant. I think the ratio of median family income Black to white was like 0.4 something like that, 40% on a dollar of uh, family income, and it'll be like 0.7 right now. Uh, I think the representation of African-Americans in the professions was essentially zilch. I'm talking about law, medicine, engineering, and so on. Uh, segregation was rampant. Lynching was still ongoing, et cetera. Uh, and this is within a lifetime of uh, my lifetime. I was born in 1948. Uh, of, uh, of uh, transformation is really quite remarkable. I, I, I don't think you can find another example, frankly, of a country of any size with a substantial uh, racial ethnic uh, minority of subordinated persons who had been held in a kind of serfdom-like status, uh, whose uh, uh, position within society has improved to the same degree and extent as has been the case for African-Americans. I mean, we lose sight of this because uh, the little bit of progress remaining to be uh, realized uh, looms so large in our minds, especially for the activists. But I, I think a fair historical reading uh, would uh, would contradict the uh, the narrative coming out of the likes of uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates. But I want to say something else, Heather, and see how you react to it. Because you mentioned disparate impact, and I think that's the heart of the matter. Yep. The heart of the matter is there are racial differences in the average rates of success in certain kinds of activities and a failure in certain kinds of activities. There's an overrepresentation of Blacks amongst people who are in prisons. So that's called mass incarceration, and it's said to be racist. There's an underrepresentation of Blacks amongst people who are achieving outstanding results in some of the uh, academic specialties. And that's called not enough Black faculty in the physics department, not enough Black faculty in the sociology department. Universities are beating themselves because there is uh, not enough representation. And what I think we've got is the juxtaposition of two things. I think we've got the fact of this dramatic historical transformation in the status of African-Americans from a kind of serfdom into something that's very close to equal citizenship and in some cases, privileged benefits uh, because of affirmative action and so on. We've got that, but we've also got the persistence of inequality. We've got the overrepresentation of blacks amongst those who are incarcerated. We've got a huge, uh, achievement gap in uh, uh, the educational spheres and so forth. And people are just having a hard time dealing with these two things and it requires a denial of one or the other. Um, uh, it requires saying it's the system's fault. That's where I think systemic racism comes from. It's basically saying, yes, there are disparities, but no, it's not the fault of uh, African-Americans who suffer on the short end of this. Yes, there's an overrepresentation of blacks in prison, but no, it's not because there are greater uh, criminal offending, it's because the cops are biased, the laws are biased, and so forth and so on. Right. Yes, there's a shortage of black professors, but no, it's not Princeton University declares to the world, we've got to do better. Brown University doubles down its commitment to diversity and inclusion. Harvard University declares diversity, inclusion, and belonging, and belonging uh, in, in the face of the uh, insufficient numbers of African Americans. The stench of failure is in the air and people just can't bear it. I, I, I say that as a proud African-American, failure, failure to see such opportunities as, as exist in the society, the existence of which opportunities are demonstrated by the fact that others who are not of European origin, who are coming to our country in the millions over the last couple of generations are seizing these very same opportunities. So, that is what I think is at the at the core of this uh, distemper, um, and and, and I, I think it's fraught with all kinds of interesting psychological and and really feel more philosophic aspects. Shame, shame, shame at the failure. Uh, uh, a, a kind of uh, bluff, a bluffing that goes on where people dare you to say they you know they they trot out the evidence of the disparate impact. They assume that the only acceptable explanation of it 
is uh, unfair treatment. And they basically dare you to contradict him. They, they dare you to call whoever it is, George Floyd, what he actually was. They're, they're daring you to say, if you didn't resist the rest, you wouldn't end up in a physical conflict with a police officer, the consequences of which can be fatal, uh, et cetera. Well, the cardinal rule in progressive or liberal discourse is thou shall not observe behavior and culture that is dysfunctional when it comes to official victim groups. You're just not allowed to see it. As you say, the only allowable explanation is system and structure. And this began with that book in the 1960s, so you cannot blame the victim. I don't yeah. know where that came out of, but that it was is- the It was a reaction to the Moynihan report. I see, right. So you have to treat blacks as, as automata, as people who do not have agency, uh, who are inevitable uh, pawns of structures in which they live and that cannot make good decisions uh, through their own individual uh, choice choices. They, they are doomed and destined to end up in those situations where they are not competitively qualified for a whole variety of jobs. And I've said before, that is to me the basic divide between a conservative and a, and a liberal outlook is that uh, conservatives are more likely to see large scale outcomes or individual outcomes as the result of bad choices or good choices and decision making and and liberals will see structure. Now, both sides are blind. I could, I'm willing to admit that perhaps conservatives are not attuned enough to inherited structural disadvantages, uh, but I think it is as just purely a, um, a a strategy for success. One's better off erring on the side of, yeah, you've been dealt a bad hand, but you can make certain basic decisions that will vastly improve your lot in life. And you know, this is the the success uh, strategy yeah. that we've heard about from William Galston. Yeah. But uh, you know. Instead, you have elite culture now struggling for any other explanation other than a lack of a fanatical school culture, uh, the, the, the disappearance of fathers, which is not only important for any individual child, but is equally important for having a culture that values paternal responsibility and marriage and sends a message to young males that they are expected to develop those bourgeois habits of deferred gratification and self-reliance that would make them acceptable mates. So what we have now is really sort of the pathos of these uh, statue burnings and, and monument desecrations with the idea <laughs> that if we, if we get rid of some statue in some public park that nobody for the last two centuries has known what the hell it represents and who that person is. But if we get rid of all these statues uh, and, and, and names on streets, that somehow uh, black academic achievement is gonna improve. I can guarantee you, we can throw out everything. We can, we can get rid of Washington DC. We can tear down the Washington Mall. Nothing is going to change because it's not the statues that are responsible for the academic achievement gap. Uh, yeah, they're, I would they're, say they're saying that the statues are a symbolic uh, emblem or representation of a history of, of racial domination they're. and so on. And, and you know, I mean, but I, I agree with it's you. It's not that depressing it, it, effort. It's all, it's, it's it's all a kind of symbolic thing, and it doesn't get to it doesn't get down to cases. It doesn't get down to how kids are being raised, how they're being educated, etc. It they're is also a symbol. going to say, Heather, I just have to say this. They they're also going to say, look at such deficiencies that you see in uh, uh, African American social life, family life, and so forth are themselves the consequences, or at least to some degree, of a history of exclusion and so forth. They're going to say slavery was a total kind of domination thing where families didn't have a chance to breathe. They're going to say uh, that the, the denial of access to employment opportunities for black men uh, helped to undermine their standing with the family and encourage a kind of matriarchal dynamic to evolve and so forth and so on. So they're going to say, sure, 
a first order observation would leave us thinking that these people are not behaving properly, but a deeper and more sophisticated historical view would understand that the reasons that the blacks are like this and the Jews are like that and the Asians are like this and so forth are themselves the product of, of uh, structural uh, dynamics. That's what they're gonna say, to which I would say, please, really? I can't shape my own life. I'm completely a prisoner of some, uh, you know, I'm a puppet at the end of the string being pulled this way and that by historical forces. I don't believe that for a minute. I mean, if I believe that, what, what kind of way of being in the world is it to think that I have no control over what happens in my own life or in, in the lives of my children? I would say, and here I kind of uh, echo Amy Wax. Yes, right, I right. mentioned Amy Wax. If you step off the curb and a negligent bus driver runs over you, that's obviously not your fault. You're a victim of negligence. But if you don't go to physical therapy, you're never going to walk again. Now, whose responsibility is it to get up, go through the painful exercises and recover the facility to walk? It's your responsibility, notwithstanding the fact that the bus driver should have been paying attention. And that, it, for me, that's where we are as African-Americans here now. It's our responsibility to raise our children. It's our responsibility to make the most of the, the best of a hand that, you know, to some degree has been a bad hand, but it's nevertheless our responsibility. No one is going to do it for us. Nobody is coming to save us. That's, well, the, that's the speech I've been given. Yeah, I, w I was going to mention precisely that, the Amy Wax Rights and Remedies. And it's not just responsibility, it's efficacy. Uh, you know, what she yeah. also emphasized is that as whether they not have a, we have a responsibility we can't do it there is not a substitute government programs are not a substitute for fathers and the idea that we that there hasn't been massive effort uh on the part of society as a collective to try and change those urban pathologies is ludicrous and it's not just the trillions of dollars that have been spent in government uh, transfer programs and, and social services. I don't know a single wealthy Republican donor who is not trying with, again, true good intentions and goodwill uh, to help people in the inner city, whether it's the after school chess program or guarantees of tuition payments. Yeah. Like, the idea to get back to this ludicrous meme of white supremacy is ridiculous. I, I think that the vast majority of whites today have nothing but goodwill for blacks and those with power uh, exert that power to try and change and, and close that skills gap to the extent they can. But the question is, do, has that worked and can it work? It, it cannot without without individual effort. And and on the the sort of statues and, and his, history of discrimination point, I recently reread uh, Trollope's The Way We Live Now because I was recording a, a book discussion on George Eliot's Middlemarch with, with Michael Knowles and I wanted just a comparison of Victorian novelists for style and and sort of work. Can I just say this? I love this about you, Heather, <laughs> that you are a very cultured woman, music, opera, literature, <laughs> and whatnot, but you write the most trenchant essays on political and social <laughs> matters, and that's a rare thing to find, I tell you. So I, I you know, hats well, off to you. Well, thank you. I wish I wish I could spend all my time on beauty, as I'm sure you do. Well, you and and not not taking on this this uh tragic yeah. stuff but but anyway what was clear uh, in the trollop was um the the frank portrayal at least and whether it's shared by trollop one can question of anti-catholicism but particularly anti-semitism uh there's a character uh in in the trollop way we live now who's uh a jewish merchant very successful and he is the target of of just absolutely unapologetic shameless proud anti-Semitism on the part of a family whose daughter is so at her wit's end for not being married as an, and she thinks she's becoming an old maid that she's actually contemplating marrying this guy. He turns out to be a, one of the noblest characters in the book. So whether Trollope shares that, that um, anti-Semitism is questionable, but ultimately irrelevant as far as I'm concerned. My point only is that uh, the history of anti-Semitism as, as you know, you mentioned Princeton, uh, that's one of the things that Princeton is currently 
beating its chest about, but it hasn't been anti-Semitic for decades. Uh, but but there was very real contempt and hatred for Jews. And they basically said to hell with that and whooped everybody's ass anyway. Uh, they put up with the segregation, they gradually worked their way in, but they they embraced Western civilization. I mean, some of our greatest literary critics have been Jewish uh, and read these books of, of, of the English 19th century Victorians with, with perspicacity and, and gratitude. So, you know, one doesn't want to sort of play one group off against another, but there are historical examples of the possibility of overcoming societal-wide discrimination by dint of hard work. And we are just not willing to send that message today. Nobody is saying that. It is very curious, and it gets back to the original question you posed, Glenn, which is, what the hell is going on here? And, and I repeat myself that I think that whites are preemptively wanting to solidify the myth of bias and the bias explanation uh, because they don't want to contemplate other possible explanations for, for the persistence of, of those large-scale inequalities. Well, other possible explanations include uh, essential or genetically based differences between populations, and that is, you know, verboten. We know that that's racist, and we know that that argument is out there. Uh, so that should be noted. <laughs> Uh, but you right, speak right. of the Jews, you speak of the Jews. And I want to make two points. One is, if you do so much bean counting that you're telling me about underrepresentation every time there's any kind of selective activity, like who gets in the faculty of a great university, and they're not enough Blacks, they're not they're underrepresented. Well, you know, the representation numbers have to add up to one, the fractions. They have to add up to one. So if there's underrepresentation, there's overrepresentation. I don't know how you go down the road of a discourse about underrepresentation without implicitly indicting the overrepresented for somehow or another not being deserving of their status. Well, that's going to be the Jews in many cases. Okay, so <laughs> you better think about that. Um, the other point I want to make is I agree that, the, you know, as an African-American, I have had to confront this personally. People have doubt about your abilities. They don't know whether or not you're fit. Sure. Now, there are a couple of ways of responding to that. One of them is to dismiss their doubts, call them racist, and tell them to go to hell. Another is to double down your effort and dispel their doubts. Here, you look at what I just accomplished. You think I'm not fit? Deal with that. Um there is actually a case to be made for the second uh, way of uh, going about it, because the first way invites patronization. It, it invites uh, people to, uh, to, to tolerate you by saying, oh, yes, you're right, you're right, uh, we have to do better. The second way is, the, is, is, a, is a way of power. Uh, I have a friend who's an African-American scientist, and he's always talking about racism in science, to whom I say, you know what, if Albert Einstein, with, I think the year was 1903 when he published those three great papers on special relativity, on Brownian motion, and on the photoelectric effect. He, he published three papers, any one of which, in one year, any one of which could have been uh, worthy of a Nobel Prize. I say if Einstein had spent as much time thinking about being Jewish as you spent thinking about being Black, he would have never had time to write those papers. <laughs> Well, <laughs> yeah, he's also not going to get hired today because a lot of schools now are making diversity commitment and diversity yeah, totally. status the precondition to being considered in STEM. School after school in the University of California system, the initial screening procedure is, is your diversity statement of sufficient enthusiasm and zealotry uh, or are you going to contribute to diversity, i.e., are you female or minority? Uh, and and if you don't pass that bar, your your uh, your application to teach is put in the junk file. It's remarkable. So whether Einstein would have gotten through, uh, whether people that were developing nuclear physics, you know, Lawrence Liverpool Laboratory, yeah. none of them would have. Uh, because they were too involved in the eros of knowledge, of pursuing the the uh, ability to understand our universe. So it is it is truly incredible 
the diversion of our scientific talent. Somebody sent me uh, a, a notice from the University of California, Davis, uh, a, a science department that sent around a memo that they'd had a very long conversation about this and they've decided they have to stop calling their their uh, weekly meetings within the department brown bag lunches. Oh, come on. This is what our scientists oh, are doing. Oh, but that's just so silly. I'm sorry, it's silly. They're doing it. Come on, it's silly. I have the academic, everything is silly. Everything <laughs> is silly. I mean, this is what we're doing. I don't but, believe but in conspiracy theories. I, I don't believe I don't believe in conspiracy theories, but I'm moving to the point now where I do think it is conceivable that China is the funder of our diversity. <laughs> Okay. Uh, ideology, because this is this is suicide. This is scientific suicide. Okay, Donald J. Trump. His name came up briefly before. We've only got a few minutes, and I wanted to raise the name again because I believe, without being able to prove it, that the advent of Trump and the schism in our politics that has come about because of Trump's success, getting himself elected president, appointing three Supreme Court justices, it will be soon enough, um, and the hatred of Trump by by many. Uh, quarters, including some Republicans, is somehow implicated in this moment. I mean, I can't prove it, but I somehow feel that if we ask why is the press not reporting differently, that the answer, at least in part, is because if they did, they reckon it would help Trump. If we ask why are uh, activists seizing on certain kinds of tropes, I think the heightened sense of their um, being behind the barricades and under uh, duress because uh, Trump represents a certain thrust in American culture and politics. He's pro-life, he's pro-gun, he wants a border, uh, he's, he's not an, an internationalist and whatnot, threatens uh, people in ways that they are then somehow reacting to. I've said enough, I wanna hear what you think about the role that Trump's ascendancy plays in uh, contributing in people's reactions to it plays in contributing to this uh, this moment of crisis that we're in? I both agree and disagree. I think that you're being way too charitable towards the press to think that pre-Trump, they were reporting the facts. I mean, Glenn, you know that's not the case. The New York Times has been running its, its gotcha bean counting stories on diversity in companies and, and whether it's gender or sex or, or race forever. Uh, they've been promoting uh, the racial divisiveness. So I, I think that this is, I see it more as the result of another, say, l let's look at the first iteration of the Black Lives Matter movement in 2015 and 2016. Yeah. Things are much worse. The, the What I call the Ferguson effect, we can redub it either Ferguson effect 2.0 or the Minneapolis effect is much worse. The, the breakdown is much faster. The crime increase is much faster. I attribute that to another five years of poisonous academic ideology. And with all due respect, I agree. You've been, Brown, Glenn, you're right, that it is possible if you are an extremely enlightened student to find teachers like you in the social sciences and the hard sciences, and you're Thank doing you. very, very hard work. Very, those students are, are, are working their butts off. But the import or the export from universities today is overwhelmingly this this very poisonous ideology. Um, so that's what's going on, is we are becoming more and more of a marinated, a society marinated in academic ideology. That being said, I think that, yes, the degree of hysteria that and the, the sheer uh, insanity of the mainstream establishment is is heightened by the Trump hatred. But nevertheless, if we got rid of Trump, like for instance, here's a thought experiment. There's many people who are optimistic who say, when Biden is elected, this all ends, that we open the economy, no more uh, white supremacy talk, no more white privilege trainings. I disagree completely. I think this thing is a juggernaut that is fueled by something that long preceded Trump. But do you think if, if when Biden is, I'm saying when, not if, and I'm gonna make all the Trump supporters, which uh, very mad. Yeah, it does uh, look like he's gonna be elected. But do you think so? Do you think that, that we're going to return to sanity or is, is Biden going to just continue 
uh, the left wing agenda, which has, I think it's a juggernaut right now. Well, the latter. I mean, we may have a less, uh, you know, uh, tortured kind of uh, public uh, uh, schism. Uh, I don't know how Trump's people will react to losing. Maybe they'll react better than Hillary Clinton's people reacted to losing. So it may tamp down the temperature a little bit. <laughs> but I just got a former student who works for the ACLU just sent me a notice saying, I'm on a task force to try to figure out what a Biden administration should do. What are your three best ideas for anti-racist policies in the event of a Biden administration? These people are getting ready for, uh, you know, rolling back everything that Trump was trying to do and, and pushing forward on uh, on their own stuff. Right, we may get uh, Kendi's and now we might we may get the amendment. I mean, I am I am such a pessimist that I am not going to rule that out that we get an anti-racism amendment to the Constitution. Oh no! And no. If, if that happens, well, we'll see. We didn't I, get I, the I, equal rights amendment. How are we going to get and because, there are more women than there are black people? <laughs> because we've had another 40, 50 years of this, we've had more and more people going out into the corporations, into the law firms, into government, into the arts organizations uh, that have been marinated in this stuff. Again, it breaks my heart to see Julia, the head of Julia, okay, nobody is defending the civilization. And that's because uh, of, of the academic culture that is telling us to hate our past and to hate each other. Um, this is Glenn Lowry. I'm with Heather McDonald. We've been having a conversation and I have enjoyed the heck out of it, but I'm going to give it back to Hannah now uh, and the Manhattan Institute Central. So thanks so much, Heather. Thank you, Glenn. I look forward to talking to you again. Me too. My friend. <laughs> Uh, well, they say the better the company, the darker the conversation. Um, so thank you both for letting us all be flies on the wall as two friends, newly codified, um, discussed some of the most troubling and looming problems around us right now. Um, we are so appreciative of your time and of your thoughts. Uh, before we close, I would like to invite our public audience to sign up on our website to receive updates from the Policing and Public Safety Initiative, including information on our two event casts happening next, next week. One will focus on different models of police reform, including total department overhaul, and the other on the experiences and perspectives of Black police executives. On our website, you can also browse the Manhattan Institute's research and subscribe to our newsletters. If you are able, please also consider supporting the Institute at the link you see below. Uh, MI is a nonprofit organization, and our work depends on the support of people like you. Um, again, thank you to our, our two fantastic guests. I've never heard such dismal information uh, put forth um, with so much charm, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and it was a delight to listen to both of you. Thank you, everybody.